All right. here no to my house. Our second speaker of the afternoon is somebody who's also recently retired. <laughs> people in the room, I don't think that's fit. <laughs> so it's a, uh, always a pleasure to be uh, in London, and a very special pleasure to be here on this occasion. We show our respect and affection for Bill, but uh, competitiveness never dies. Uh, so we just mentioned retirement, so I had to tell Bill I beat him to retirement. Uh, <laughs> I learned Bill's official retirement date is June 30. Right. So on April 30, Bill, I became distinguished university professor emeritus. And I did it without ever using the bike helmet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have had the bike helmet. <laughs> I would have had to retire. <laughs> um, OK, well, I've used uh, Bill's work uh, on Newton uh, and decision theory in various courses I've taught, but I'm not a, enough of an expert on those topics to dare uh, talk about them uh, for an audience like this. So I've chosen a different topic and mindful of the fact that we've uh, had a, a number of heavy duty talks today, I, I thought I would um, uh, choose a topic that's a little bit uh, 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 lighter. Uh, so I'm going to talk about. Uh, Super tasks. <laughs> uh, and I think the place to begin on super tasks is at the uh, beginning, uh, which is the fourth century BC. Uh, Are those fourth century interstates? What? <laughs> Are those fourth century interstates on the map? Uh, yeah, I'll attempt to read at times this is. Uh, a Greek colony, and the Greeks are very good, uh, very good engineers. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're in a town called Elia, uh, 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 and of course the most uh, illustrious uh, citizen was Parmenides, who thought that uh, uh, what is real is unchanging. And, and as you know, his disciple uh, Zeno designed various paradoxes to confute the critics of his uh, now let's not do uh, Achilles and the tortoise. Uh, I think the tortoise is just a distraction. So let's do the uh, dichotomy uh, for the racetrack. So Achilles is given the task of getting from the start line to the finish line. Uh, can he do it? Well, Zeno says, look, first he has to cover uh, half the distance, and then half the remaining distance, and half the remaining distance, and so on. Uh, on infinitum, so Achilles would have to perform uh, a super task. He had to perform an infinite number of actions in a finite time, and that was you not know, uh, uh, impossible. And I think the modern uh, reaction is apt to be uh, ho hum. Uh, <laughs> of course, our uh, perception of, of motion and change is uh, not an illusion or uh, delusion. So. Zeno's paradox, this must be so much sophistry. Now, uh, uh, this reaction, I, I, I think, raises two issues. First of all, given that no considerations about uh, involving uh, races with tortoises and Greek warriors could convince us that uh, change uh, is not real, what kind of argument uh, could challenge uh, the notion that, that change is uh, real? And if I have time, I'll come back to that question uh, at the end. Uh, second, uh, Zeno's analysis uh, uh, trivializes the notion of super task, right? Because in Zeno's analysis, any action, like raising my arm, uh, is a super task. But intuitively, you know, raising my arm is not a genuine uh, super task because it doesn't involve the performance of an infinite number of separate and physically distinct actions. Now, the, the uh, idea of a genuine super task has struck many philosophers as uh, being deeply problematic, and there are a number of arguments to the effect that genuine super tasks uh, involve a, some sort of logical or 
conceptual uh, absurdity, and I'm going to try to convince you that examining these arguments uh, can be both uh, amusing and uh, instructive. So what would, what would be an example of a genuine super task? Well, how, how can we turn Zeno's original super task into a genuine super task? And here's uh, an idea from Adolf Grunbaum. We ask Achilles to run in a staccato fashion. So he has to get uh, from the start line to the halfway uh, point in 10 seconds, and he pauses for 10 seconds. Then he covers half the remaining distance in five seconds, and pauses for five seconds, and so on and so on, on infinitum. And this does seem to constitute a genuine super test. The sub runs are uh, intuitively separate and physically distinct actions that are separated by laws. Now, we can worry about the physical uh, implementation of this uh, super task, right? Because maybe carrying out this schedule would require the uh, runner to uh, achieve unbounded acceleration and he would just shake himself to bits before he get to the finish line. Or maybe it requires various parts of the runner's body to be traveling faster than the speed of light by by like the theory of relativity. I'll talk about uh, physical limitations on super, super tasks later, but now all I'm interested in establishing is that we have some examples of genuine super tasks that don't seem to implicate any logical absurdity. Now, if you don't like that example, here's another one. Uh, the bouncing ball. So suppose we have a ball that bounces on a hard surface with each bounce, uh, it loses 9 tenths of its speed, and as a result, the height of the bounces uh, diminishes as time goes on, but there's no last bounce, right? Each bounce is followed by another less frequent bounce. How long does it take for the ball to complete an infinity of bounces? Well, we know from elementary kinematics that the time it takes from one bounce to another is proportional to the initial speed of the ball as it enters the cycle. So, so let's make life easy and just assume that the time between bounces one and two is one second. So therefore, the time between bounces two and three is one tenth of a second, uh, and so on and so on, on an item. So in one and one ninth second, the ball has completed uh, an infinity of bounces. Uh, here's the picture. If there's sufficient number of bounces, of course, that the naked eye won't be able to tell the difference between the bounces. But again, intuitively, this seems to uh, count as a genuine uh, super task uh, because it involves the performance of an infinite number of separate uh, physically distinct uh, actions. And again, we can worry about the uh, physical implementation of this because any actual ball is going to be compressible, and so uh, kinetic energy is going to get dissipated and after a finite number of bounces will come to rest. But again, all I'm concerned with at this point is just to have some concrete examples before us of, of genuine super tasks that don't seem to implicate a contradiction, at least not in any obvious form. Uh, still, there may be some subclass of genuine super tasks uh, uh, that are uh, uh, struck down by uh, entailing uh, logical contradictions, and the most uh, famous or infamous version uh, is the uh, Thompson lamp, and I'll just let you read Thompson's description of how this lamp works. Here's the comment of my teacher, Paul Damasio. Rarely are we presented with an argument so needed convincing. This one has only one flaw. It is invalid. Uh, Paul can be a bit sarcastic uh, at times. So what was his point? Well, here's the 
switching the schedule. I'm in stage one, uh, Monday to midnight, and I have this uh, switch on, and stage two, I have to midnight, switch off, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and infinitum. Now, Paul's point is simply that the switching schedule refers to time strictly before midnight, right? So unless you believe in logical determinism or fatalism, there's simply not enough information in the switching schedule to determine the state of the lamp at midnight. So either state of the lamp, the on state or the off state, it is uh, at midnight is, is perfectly compatible with this uh, uh, switching schedule. And then just to drive the point home, let's hook up the Thompson lamp with a bouncing ball. I have to allow me some license here, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, so we've got a, a metal ball bouncing on a metal plate, and when it hits the plate, it completes a, a circuit, and, and, and the lamp uh, is uh, switched on. Now, I'm just idealizing and suppose, supposing that the electrical current flows instantaneously and so on, but that, that, that's okay for present purposes. So, infinite number of bounces are executed uh, before midnight. The lamp goes on and off an infinite number of times, and at midnight, when the ball is at rest on the contact plate, the lamp is in the on state. If you prefer the off state at midnight, then bring it up this way so that when the ball hits the contact uh, plate, it, it shorts out the circuit and uh, goes off. So when the ball is at rest uh, on the plate at midnight, it's the off state. Okay. Now, uh, uh, MIT was unable to produce a contradiction. Uh, maybe Cornell would be able to do better. We know we can count on our colleagues at Cornell to argue for a don't get conclusion. So uh, uh, here's Max Black's uh, uh, transfer device. It involves a uh, marble that is shuttled between two trays, <coughs> the right and the trays are kept at constant distance apart. Stage one, one minute to midnight, uh, transfer the marble. The left tray, the right tray, stage two, one half of the minute to midnight transfer the marble from the right tray to the left tray, and so on and so on. Uh, so a genuine super test, black uh, thought uh, was logically impossible to carry it out uh, because he thought there's no consistent answer to the question, where is the marble at midnight? So how, how do they argue this conclusion? Well, you could analogize uh, uh, this device to the uh, Thompson lamp, analogize being in the you know, left tray being in the on state, being in the right tray being in the off state, uh, and then argue in the way that Thompson did. You know, that's a bad argument. So here's a somewhat more clever argument. Suppose that this uh, infinite series of uh, shuttles from the left to the right, right to the left, and so on. Uh, the measure weights in the marble being in the left-handed tray at midnight. Well, if that process is possible, so is its mirror image. So the mirror image process, the marble end up in the right tray. Now, uh, the upshot of this infinite sequence of, 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 of shuttles shouldn't uh, depend on what happens in the initial finite segment. So let's just knock that guy off. And now notice that we have two identical sequences of shuttles, but they have different uh, end results, and that black thought was a contradiction. Well, of course, it's not. Vanassaro's uh, 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 point uh, applies here and, uh, as well. The shuttle schedule refers to time strictly before so and, uh, uh, the schedule simply doesn't give us enough information to determine the state of the marble. Okay, but let's be fair uh, to Black. Uh, I think an, an implicit assumption of this transfer device is that the marble moves continuously, right? You can't just hop from one point to another without passing through all of the intervening points. And now it seems we're much closer to a contradiction. Can the marble be in the left-hand tray at midnight? No. Suppose for reductio that it does end up in the left-hand tray at midnight. Well, by continuity of motion, uh, no matter how
how small a neighborhood shows of the left hand tray, the marble has to enter that neighborhood and remain uh, in it as midway is approached. But that's inconsistent with the shuttle schedule because no matter how close we get to midnight, there is a time still short, short of midnight at which the marble is in the right hand tray. So it can't be in the left hand tray. Same argument shows it can't be in the right hand tray. It can't be uh, somewhere in the middle. It can't be out here either. Same argument. So it can't be anywhere. Contradiction. No. No. To see why, let's go to another one. Spaceship. A spaceship travels in a straight line and doubles its speed after one half minute, uh, doubles it again after another quarter minute, and so on. By the way, where is it after one minute? Well, assuming that the motion of the spaceship is continuous and that its mass doesn't uh, just evaporate, it must be somewhere. But it can't be at any finite distance by construction. And it can't be at spatial infinity because there is no such purpose as spatial. Contradiction? No. <laughs> no. So here's the possible world line of the spaceship. So, so uh, a space time diagram of time increasing is what we're talking about. So the uh, spaceship accelerates very, 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 very hard. Uh, uh, at no time is the spaceship moving infinitely fast. Try to draw it so that the uh, world line of the spaceship never has a, an exactly horizontal slope that works in the spaceship going infinitely fast with the thing you want. Uh, but the spaceship does reach unbounded speeds uh, uh, in a finite amount of time. So at the magic escape time that I labeled T equals T star, the spaceship is uh, nowhere in space because the the world line of the rocket ship never intersects that uh, uh, surface T equals T star, so it has no finite spatial position. Uh, and it does this, although its motion is continuous, it doesn't you know, shrink to zero, its mass doesn't evaporate. So if you like, we can say uh, the spaceship escapes to spatial infinity in a finite time. We have to realize that doesn't mean it goes to some place of spatial infinity. There is no such place. It just means that it has no finite spatial position uh, at the time uh, t equals t star. Now, you might be wondering uh, what happened to conservation of mass. Right, so before t equals t star, we had some mass in the universe. After t equals t star, we had no mass. What happened to the mass? But what this example uh, brings out um, is that we have to distinguish between two different senses of conservation of mass. Right? The first sense says that the mass of a particle is constant along the world line of that particle, and the particle uh, uh, world lines are continuous and without endpoints. So the mass just doesn't pop into or out of existence, and, and along the world line, this is constant. The second sense of conservation says that for all times t1 and t2, the total mass uh, in the universe is the t1 is the total mass of t2. Now, if we can't have any uh, rocket ships that go off to spatial infinity in a finite amount of time, then these two uh, senses of uh, conservation of mass are equivalent. Uh, but if we do have escape solutions, then we can have, have the first sense of This is a little Sorry, less. Kevin, how can that be equivalent? Because a constant two says nothing about world lines being continuous. It would be compatible with them bouncing from place to place discontinuously as long as they kept their mass. So I say again. How, how, how can constant two entail constant one? Because constant two says nothing about conti continuity. Oh, I, I, I see. I see what you're. I should have, I should have just made uh, con. To a, a conjunction. Okay. To, 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 Fine. To, 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 thank you. Uh, and also, this example uh, gives us a failure of, uh, of, of determinism, right? Uh, if you 
original picture, we have a failure of determinism towards the past, but if, if you like to think of determinism as, a, as always being about the future, then just do the time reverse. Okay, so now we have a particle coming in uh, from spatial infinity and then decelerating. So here's the state of the universe before t equals t star. It's the maximally boring universe in which nothing is happening. So what would you predict about the future? Well, my prediction might be it's going to continue to be maximally boring. But another better prediction would be something interesting is going to happen. So uh, which of those predictions is going to uh, come true? Well, the theory doesn't, uh, uh, the theory doesn't tell us. OK, so uh, oh, now one might think, well, of course, we can draw uh, uh, mathematical diagrams like this of uh, uh, things escaping to infinity. Well, what's this got to do with physics? Well, it does have something to do with Newton. Uh, so consider a system of uh, point mass particles interacting via an attractive one of force and then some loss of motion. Now, uh, a solution to uh, Newton's equation of motion for this problem uh, can break down uh, yeah, if we have a collision singularity, because the one, of course, where the one just blows up. Uh, if we're in one spatial dimension, we can regularize the collision on, on the model of, of an elastic balance, but if we're in you know, three spatial dimensions, that doesn't work. But, but let's just uh, suppose we don't have a collision singularity. Uh, we can worry whether or not the solution can break down uh, because of a non-collision singularity in which all of the particles accelerate themselves off to spatial uh, infinity in a finite amount of time. And it was conjectured uh, in the early part of the 20th century that there can be non-collision singularities, uh, but it wasn't rigorously uh, uh, proved that it either can be until, until 1995. So, so this is a, an example of Real physics, although of course idealized physics of uh, 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 point mass particles. Okay, so let's go back to Black's transfer device. And now I think you can see how to, a consistent way in which we can uh, carry out the, the uh, infinite number of shuttles between the left tray and the right tray. So here's the uh, space time diagram of the position of the left hand tray and the right hand tray. And have the marble going back and forth faster and faster, faster and going further and further each time. And at uh, 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 midnight, it's nowhere in some sense, escape to station infinity. And it has been shown that you can uh, instantiate this kind of behavior uh, with a system of uh, point mass Newtonian particles that are interacting uh, uh, with one another to, uh, just by elastic. But you need an infinite system <coughs> to achieve uh, 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 this kind of behavior. Now, we really hunger for a contradiction. We love, we love contradictions. So, for God's sake, let's get one. Uh, so, let's put the black transfer device inside of a, a box with impenetrable walls, and now the marble can't uh, escape. To infinity, so it looks like we closed all of the escape hatches here, and we finally got a contradiction. Not quite. Uh, and I'll uh, I won't tell you what the escape hatch is, but I'll give you two luminous efforts to come up with the solution. Okay. Now I want to um, continue with this theme of hooking up uh, super tasks with, with issues in. Foundations of physics. Um, but uh, before I do that, let me give you one other little uh, super task paradox that I can know. This is the urn uh, paradox. So we've got a urn with infinite you know, capacity. We've got a bunch of balls that are numbered one, two, three, four, and so on. And we put them in the urn and take them out according to the following schedule. Stage one, uh, we put in balls one through ten. Two, stage two, we put in 11 through 20, we're ball number four, and so on, body infinite. So, how many balls can you earn in? You 
both meet one of those. Also has unit mass is 
moving with unit velocity, and we postulate uh, elastic collisions. So what's going to get, what's going to happen? When the cue ball collides with ball number one, the cue ball comes to rest here. Ball number one goes off with unit velocity. It collides with ball number two. Ball number one comes to rest here. Ball number two goes off with uh, velocity. So the picture. moving to the right until it gets down to the end of the uh, uh, interval. But like, how can it do that without passing uh, through all of the uh, object poles? So it looks like we just don't have a consistent uh, evolution for this system. No, not quite right, uh, because we can have uh, what people have begun to call a uh, global collision between the uh, cue ball and the object ball. Uh, so even though the <laughs> cue ball doesn't collide with any particular ball, it, so to speak, makes a global collision, uh, all of the object balls self-excite themselves and move off to the right, leaving a clear space for the cue ball to get down to the end of the interval. And this has been shown by Mr. 
compel to be uh, uh, to be consistent with the, with the laws that the last of them have been So, uh, so sorry, uh, no contradiction. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about uh, the implications of uh, uh, quantum mechanics and relativity theory for uh, for super tasks. So some of the super tasks I've been discussing involve a failure of, uh, of determinism in classical mechanics. And in this regard, uh, quantum mechanics can make super tasking harder because in some respects, quantum mechanics is more deterministic than classical mechanics. More deterministic leaving aside state vector uh, collapse, which I hope nobody believes in. Um, <laughs> so we've seen that uh, in a case of a finite number of Newtonian point mass particles interacting via Newton's 1 over uh, uh, R squared law, the solution can break down for two reasons. One, you have a collision singularity, or two, you have a non-collision singularity. All of the particles go up to spatial infinity a finite amount of time. And quantum mechanics, I claim, uh, cures both of these mythologies, because if you write down the uh, Hamiltonian uh, operator for this system, you find out that the operator is is essentially self-adjoint, so that means it has a unique self-adjoint extension. You exponentiate that uh, uh, and get uh, 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 a unitary operator, which gives you the uh, uh, time evolution of the system. And so the, uh, the evolution, quantum mechanically, is well-defined uh, 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 for all times. There is no, uh, uh, there is no singularity in the solution. So quantum mechanics cures this ill of quantum mechanics. And in the case of uh, Xeno's revenge, uh, uh, quantum mechanics in some sense just doesn't allow the setup. Because in Xeno's re revenge, we had to imagine that we have an infinite number of balls, uh, Xeno packed uh, into a unit interval, and that initially all these balls are at rest. Well, if we're going to squeeze in an infinite number of uh, wave packets in the unit interval, the delta x, uh, uh, for the uh, wave uh, packets as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we approach the, uh, the origin. But then by the uncertainty principle, uh, delta P uh, has to uh, uh, grow without bound so that uh, to no approximation can, can uh, all the particles be, be considered uh, at rest. Okay, so, so quantum mechanics cure some of these ills of uh, uh, classical mechanics and make certain uh, super tasks impossible. Uh, relativity theory also makes impossible super tasks that involve uh, uh, systems that, that have achieved uh, uh, unbounded uh, 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 velocities. But I want to point out that the general theory of relativity opens the way for uh, another kind of uh, 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 super tasks, which uh, uh, have involved uh, uh, bifurcated supertasks. Uh, now, bifurcated supertasks aren't really supertasks, but you get the effect of a supertask uh, without actually supertasking. And here's the trick. It's a division of labor. And as usual, you make the drone uh, do all the labor. Right? So the drone is born and then lives for an uh, infinite number of years. And so without doing any Xeno uh, speed up, right, the drone uh, can carry out a task that involves an infinite number of subtasks. Uh, so for example, check that Fermat's last theorem really is the theorem. Now, we all know that Andrew Miles uh, offered proof of Fermat's last theorem, but the proof is several hundred pages long, and so maybe there's a, there's a subtle error in there somewhere. So maybe the checks were premature to issue that uh, stamp. Files uh, 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 proof was announced. So what we do is ask the drone to enumerate all the four tuples of, of the integers, and then uh, check one by one to see whether or not uh, uh, there is one that, that uh, satisfies that equation. And uh, uh, this can be done uh, at each stage in a purely effective way so the drone doesn't have to exercise any engineering. 
continuity, and since she lives for an infinite amount of time, she can, she can check to all of them. Now the trick is we, are, we have the queen who really doesn't do any work, as usual, uh, arranged so that at some finite time she has access to all of the drones' results. So we uh, rig it up so that uh, uh, the drone uh, agrees to send a signal to the queen if she finds a counterexample, and otherwise she doesn't send a signal. So at the given uh, 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 time, uh, the drone knows that uh, Fermat's last theorem is true if and only if she has the received uh, signal uh, at that time. Okay, well, let, let's, let's think about what this means in terms of, uh, of space-time. So first of all, uh, uh, we need it to be that the uh, world line of the drone gamma 1 has a past end that represents the birth, uh, and then the, uh, uh, when we integrate up the proper time along her world line has to be done up to the infinite, so she has an infinite amount of time to carry out her task. And then we have to arrange the queen in such a way uh, that the queen's uh, world line contains a point, uh, p star, uh, such that the phonological past of that point, the past, the past light of that point, contains the entire uh, world line of the drone. You get the picture. Uh, now, a space-time satisfying uh, these two conditions uh, is known as a nominal homework space-time. Uh, why? Because John Norton and I named it that. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is we're going to do the data nominal So if there were such a space-time, uh, at the nominal Hogarth point of big star, uh, the queen then knows the status of her last last year. She knows that uh, uh, it's true, even though yet she's not received a signal from the drone that else in Now, is it possible to carry out such a bifurcated super task in, uh, in Kelsey's space-time, the space-time of the special theory answer is no. Kelsey space-time is not an element of the space-time. And I think you can just see this diagrammatically. So here's the world line of the queen, and let's try to suppose that there is a level of Hogarth point B star on the queen's world line. That would mean the past light node at that point has to contain the entire uh, world line of the drum. And what you can see in terms of that, <coughs> that can't be the case because down to one, uh, uh, infinite proper time as you move along at it. So eventually, you know, one's got to escape from the past light cone. So you can't do this in special relativity, um, um, but we can do it uh, in general relativity, because there are solutions to Einstein's field equations that are nominal uh, Hogarth space times. And here are three examples. One is Gödel. Uh, space-time, whose uh, 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 light cone structure is too complicated to illustrate, so, so I'll, I'll just uh, uh, make the point using uh, uh, this little artificial example. So we take uh, Minkowski space-time, roll it up along the time axis, so we get a cylindrical space-time with time wrapped around uh, the axis of the cylinder. And every uh, point in this space-time is an element of our point, uh, because the, the past light cone of any point will contain every point in the space time. You know, by, by spiraling around, uh, around, around, you get to the uh, so on. Okay, but this, this is a rather uh, nasty kind of space time. We have closed timeline curves. You might worry about the, the grandfather uh, uh, paradox of uh, time travel. And so you might think, oh, okay, uh, this may not be a physically uh, realizable uh, space time. But uh, there are other examples that don't have such nasty causal structure. There's Gleisner and Nordstrom uh, space time, which represents the exterior gravitational field of a spherically symmetric uh, electrically charged body. And the space time doesn't contain any closed time like uh, curves. And then there's something called anti-Vasseur space time. Now, I, I occasionally try to read 
reading some of the string theory uh, 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 literature, and so I frequently encounter this uh, phrase, ADS. ADS, I didn't know what that was, and, and I was too embarrassed to ask anybody. <laughs> and then it finally dawned on me, they were talking about anti-dissenter space time. Uh, they like it uh, because it has the kind of symmetries they need for a certain version of string theory. Uh, but I don't think they uh, uh, realize that it also uh, makes uh, uh, bifurcated supertasks uh, possible. Uh, so here's a crude diagram to give you a, a, a feeling for the, the, the causal structure and anti dissenter space time. So S is some generic uh, 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 time slice. Here's the world line of the, uh, of the queen. Here's the world line of the, of the drone, which is, so to speak, an analog of the, the spaceship that escapes the spatial uh, uh, infinity. And this entire uh, uh, world line, which does have infinite uh, proper length, is contained in the, in the uh, uh, past light of the of the star. Uh, so, uh, so if the space time is physically realizable, I think the answer is clearly no. Um, what Church and Turing set out to do, I mean, their, their task in front of them is they wanted to consider things like the Entscheidens problem, which is phrased in terms of, you know, is there an effectively calculable um, you know, 
with the procedure or something like that to do certain tasks. And in order to give a negative answer to that, you have to get a clear idea of what counts as an effective calculation. And they're, what they're trying to do is capture an existing notion of calculation. It's something where you, 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 it has a first step for each step. There's a, there's a next step. There's a last step. And, and it, 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 it goes in, in by, by rules. It, it is not and it never was intended to, to be a thesis about what, it, it, what is and isn't physically possible. It, it is not a counterexample to the, so even if we live in a mountain like how Hogarth's space, space time and these processes are physically possible, um, I'm very happy out of to, to agree. I don't know this paper, um, but I'm always happy to agree with Itamar. Yeah. Yeah, so that, 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 that's 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 Itamar's analysis, yeah. and, and, and and I I, I agree. He cryptid from me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so so okay, so the church thesis, or I think it's better to call it a proposal rather than a thesis, is that the informal notion of effective computability in this capture by the Turing capability. Okay, well, what's effective computability mean? Well, if you look at Turing's original uh, uh, paper, what he meant was a computation via a, a procedure which has the following characteristics. They carry out the use of the finite list of instructions. Uh, the result is produced uh, in a finite number of steps. Uh, it can, in principle, be simulated by a human using a cancer paper without the computer insight and so on and so on. But we are already with the mountain of birth uh, uh, hyper turning machine. So I, yeah. So I'm in complete agreement with you, and 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 and, uh, 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 and Itamar, uh, But then the, you know, next question is, does it uh, provide a, a violation of the thesis that what can be computed by a discrete deterministic device is 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 And I think it's somewhat more plausible that. Yes, I know Kevin. Gandhi had a proof of this. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was going to ask you. This argument is valid. Which premise you uh, get it. fails for the hyperturing machines? Well, uh, if you look at Gandhi's proof, it was the assumption that only a finite number of state transitions occur at the right. yeah. time. And of course, that's, that's No, I was, I was going to ask a friendly question. Has anybody, <laughs> <laughs> has anybody uh, pumped this up to? Uh, uh, just from your little figure there, it was hard to see how you could pump this up to a non-arithmetical set. Has anybody done that? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, Hogarth claims to have done that, but I, 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 I... What's the trick? Because you have to iterate, I mean, if, yeah, if it's yeah, like I, your anti sitter cone, you'd have to iterate that infinitely often. Yeah, you have, you have a, a nested bunch of these guys, and, and, but I, I don't follow the details of this argument, uh, and uh, so I would only trust you to evaluate it, but I can, I can, I can So, to go back to the earlier example about the point class dimension, like that. Um, can you relate that discussion to the fact that you know in continuum mechanics we get finite time singularities and obvious types of equations, which is with the water water dripping on the faucet? So there's no, I mean, that seems perfectly well posed initial data. I wish I could. I had thought about that. Uh, yeah, and that's even nicer because uh, I mean, it, in these examples, depend crucial depend crucially on the ideal idealization of, of, of point masses because that's what gives you an infinite uh, potential well on which you can uh, draw to, to, to accelerate these things into spatial infinity. So once you get rid of that um, uh, uh, idealization. Yeah, okay, thanks. I, 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 um, I just wanted to ask to uh, hear a little bit more about the claim that the quantum mechanics, the fact that the uh, Hamiltonian is essentially something going curious to because there seem to be perhaps a little more going on in the sense okay. that 
the earlier descriptions of the classical mechanical systems, you weren't giving them a Hamiltonian formulation. So it wasn't clear uh, what the phase space is going to be. And I'm worried that there might be kinematical assumptions as well as the this feature yeah. of the Hamiltonian that are important in ensuring that something is better behaved on the yeah. So in particular, Gilbert space, so you have the completeness property of Gilbert space. Right, right. Okay, well, the guy who can submit a screen right there. I mean, uh, it's not really an answer, but uh, the, the Java proof uh, that the John Cleveland simulator says he's got an Hamiltonian framework. Oh, so, okay. I mean, what, what happens? I mean, the. Uh, yeah, the, the, I've the, heard the, that described. Set, yeah. I, mean, I mean, a setup, uh, I mean, they show you can do, do a five particle set. So you have two particles uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in orbit around each other. And then you have two more. And you have a this one. That's you know, oscillating back and forth when you arrange it. So you know, oscillates back and forth. And that's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I, you should be able to get a So, is there anything about the, the Hilbert space, the completeness property of Hilbert space, that enters in? Well, uh, uh, yeah, because I mean, you're you're uh, 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 I mean, you're you're, you're, you're requiring uh, 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 in a way, you know, finite uh, uh, probability. So uh, as, uh, as soon as you can prove that you have unitary evolution, that, that, that preserves the norm. And so again, the point that you can, uh, can but I mean, I, but, but now the impressive thing is that the, you know, the, the very Hamiltonian that gives you the classical thing, evolution uh, becomes a self adjoint operator in quantum mechanics, which is pretty impressive. And also, the same thing happens in uh, at least one version of, of, of John Norton's uh, 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 dome example. So, does everybody know what this example is? You have a, uh, a dome with a particle sitting right at the top, and if you choose the slope of the dome uh, 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 just right, you're going to uh, 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 violate uh, 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 what's called a, a, a Lipschitz condition. And the, the uh, existence and uniqueness proof for solutions to ordinary differential equations uh, assume uh, uh, the Lipschitz condition, and that condition is violated, then it can happen that you get you don't get unique uh, uh, evolution corresponding to the same initial data. In this case, particle rest on top of the dome can, can be different possible evolutions. So the particle can just sit there for a while, and they can decide to go off this way. You write down the, the Hamiltonian uh, 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 for this example, you would get, find that it, it's essentially self adjoint, so you get a well defined uh, 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 quantum evolution. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. In, in that sense, quantum mechanics without state vector reduction is, is in a sense, more, more deterministic. Oh, well, I, I wanted to ask, I, 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 yeah. yeah um, this is just, I, I, I didn't, I just, didn't I just, I, I just sort of understand the way that the, uh, uh, the global uh, collision example is going to work. Can you just give me the, I, I, yeah, so, okay, so, I was, uh, so, I wasn't so, sure where the ball that comes in ends up, I guess. Yeah, so, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so we so we know from the from the previous example that it, it's possible for the uh, for the particles to, to self excite themselves, but we have to show that it's possible, consistent with the laws of, of, of elastic collision, that 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 they can excite themselves uh, in in such a way that they all move off uh, 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 to the right, leaving a clear space for the cue ball to come in uh, 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 from the left. Oh, I see. So uh, the ball is here. There. Yeah, they all start. I see. I see. Start. Okay. So, so in that the sense, the, the the cue ball globally collides. Right. All of them without colliding with. Without any, touching any, any, any yeah. particular. Yeah. Uh, 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 one of them. So, and uh, yeah. So, Mr. Mr. L spends his life trimming up. I think they're very, very. Tell a guy not to make a career. <laughs> 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 uh, so. 
of which, not sending them to you. This is just a follow-up to the last one. Uh, uh, on, on Oscillate those, back and forth. On those, yeah, exactly. On, on those kind of things, you routinely, you, know, you, you were mentioning this move of uh, uh, making conservation be local, right? So, but I never heard you say make time reversibility be local. So why can't you do that? Proposition of logic on this paper. Never underestimate proposition of logic. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so what would that do? Would that get you back to determinism? Or? Well, just in the case where time reversal was the culprit, right? I mean, you, some of those examples you had. Uh, so, like, so like the one where you've got the, the ball zooming in from infinity, if I make time reversal look local, you know, I still find that every little segment is time reversible. You still, you, so you're not saving determinism by that move. No, not that one. But oh. I was thinking about the ones, specifically the ones where it was. Uh, uh, well, well, how about the conservation of momentum one, right? When the momentum went away, I was thinking mainly about that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that is a statement. I think, I think I just what what what's what's the motivation for for maybe not uh, okay, we're postulating that. Uh, all the collisions are binary, right? And, 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 and any binary collision is an elastic collision, and that is time reversible. So, uh, Wait, is it each one is, right? I mean, I'm doing the same quantifier yeah. alternation trick as you. Oh. <laughs> Mutatis mutandis. So I guess trying to understand the proposal. So the proposal is stipulating that the re time reversal of the sort of process isn't possible, even though the time each, reversal, yeah, each, even, each segment even, is, yeah. even though the, the time reversal. So, um, so like the, the time reversal doesn't violate any local dynamics of, of collisions, but it violates a stipulation that yeah, yeah, those I like don't conservation. happen. I like local conservation better than global time reversal. So, okay, but you're still going to have a violation of uh, uh, determinism towards the past, right? Um, but maybe that's not, you don't view that as quite, quite so bad. I mean, the entire you know, future history is not going to fix the past history. So. That's right, the past is fixed. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to go back to, um, so you made the remark about the ball shuttling back between L and R, that they're still <coughs> out even when you put it in the bounded box. Oh. I just want to make clear what the parameters of the question are. So the, the two L's and R's, they're, they're a fixed finite distance apart, right. and it's got to be in the L and R according to that schedule. Then the ball, the, the ball it, there, is, there isn't going to be any continuous extension of this trajectory past midnight. Are we assuming continuity of the trajectory? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there will be continuity. So it can be continuous up to midnight, but then there won't be a, a, a continuous extension at midnight. Well, okay. so here's the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Infinity. Uh, so now I'm, I'm just going to roll it up along the along the space axis. So uh, you know, so left hand compass over here. We've got the right right hand compass yeah. over there. So now we've got the marble. <coughs> Uh, spiral oh. to the, now, this is the case I don't think we can consistently uh, uh, implement using Newtonian mechanics even with idealized point mass particles. But we 
least mathematically, this is possible. We have the so things, you know, spirals, spiral right. closer, closer, and closer. Right. You look very suspicious of this, but you know, if we can have that, then no, sure it can spiral I mean, closer, so and closer, and closer. But what are you saying? You're saying it's somewhere at at the limit. No, it's nowhere. <coughs> oh, okay, that's fine. I'm sorry, but I don't know if it's something. So, what's it doing again? So, it's, it's going around and around. It's around getting around. tighter and tighter and tighter. It tighter, never, tighter. never, never yeah. hits the limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, what's, what's, but, but, what's but, but, but this, I, but this, I don't think is. I mean, I don't know of any proof, but like, you know, the oh, the, oh, oh, it's. Oh, I, 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 I get it. The, 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 the space time is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And yeah. So the space. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's in a weird space. Yeah. So, so. So, so this is yeah. consistent with right. idealized point mass between these okay. particles, but, but I don't think I don't think this example is. But, but at least it's a mathematical escape hatch. Okay. So it looks like you know, you know, right. okay. even finitizing the system. All right. Okay. So Jim. you don't get the two the two But I'll buy you a paper. Jim, uh, my my theory might have missed something obvious, but. Surely people must argue like this, and so tell me what's wrong with the uh, light switch on and off, or the two <coughs> trays. There, what if I said they're exactly the same as, as the sequence of zeros and ones? And if the light switch is on or off at the end, that's equivalent to the sequence uh, converges to zero and one. It doesn't converge, therefore, it's a physically impossible situation. But is there anything wrong with that? Argument? I see with the trays. Yeah, well, I don't know. There are non convergent series. Yeah. So, this is, this is one. Oh, but the, okay, so, so isn't that a paradox in itself? This is a physical situation that doesn't, that is non convergent. Um, that is physically impossible. So, isn't Love that, that right? That. Isn't that enough? Or, uh, there's something missing. How about this, if I express it this way? Okay. Um, I don't worry about the physical impossibility of the light switch, you know, that's not. But there, in order for a physical, in order for a situation like this to be non-paradoxical, there must exist a possible world in which it is realized. Right. That's equivalent yeah. to saying there must exist a sequence of zeros and ones that converges, which is not true. Right. So I think Thompson tried that line, and I think the Benacerif response is that if the sequence converges, then its elements tell you what condition the lamps in at one, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't, then the condition the lamps in at one just is not tell you. Just don't tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, I think one thing is... No, then, then that's saying, that is saying that, in fact, the structure of the sequence and the physical situation are not exactly mm -hmm. the same, because, yeah. I mean, that the sequence doesn't have a final okay. version, yeah. but the physical yeah. situation, the claim is that there is a final. Maybe I can help. Um, we usually assume that if a sequence of positions converges to a limit, then, then, then that's where the thing is at, 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 that, at the limiting time. Because we usually assume that these particles have continuous trajectories. Now, you can cook up situations in which, you know, you know, in, you know not, not, not the, the wrapped around space time, but in, order spa you know, in an ordinary space time, if, we, if you can cook up a situation with thing, where the thing is bouncing back and forth, so much that you know it's got a continuous trajectory at every time uh, before midnight, but there is nothing you can do at midnight to to continue that as a tra continuous trajectory. I mean that that's certainly true, and I think that the sorts of situations that you first imagine when you think of talk to lamps are the, the switch doing something like that, yeah. and, and and as the bouncing ball points out that. There are other more clever switches that don't run you into that problem, but you know, I could suppose could cook, um, cook up a, as a thought experiment. You know, let's say its trajectory is, is like this before um, mid midnight, and then if I add on as a, as a um, another condition, oh, and it has a, con a continuous trajectory at all times, then I've simply contradicted myself. I, I, I've, 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 I've laid down an unsatisfiable set of conditions. Right. So, John, when you spiral the direction, spiral tighter and tighter, yeah. you just have to go back and forth. 
continuous trajectory, just on a plane, and tighter and tighter. And yeah. Project, project your thing on the, and it's the same thing. It's it's continuous at all times before, before the limit. Comes. But and then it's gone. It. And then it's gone. That you know, yeah. You're right. Right. You're right. It's exactly the same. Good, thank you. Yeah. But, but I mean, I think, I think it's a really great question because it, uh, what it brings out is just how seductive you know, the, the, these arguments uh, uh, were. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we shouldn't blame Thompson too much for falling into this uh, seductive uh, uh, trap. All right, shall we thank John? Please.